And then at some point in time, the prostitute no, no longer had Babylon, no longer has use to Satan. You're, you're out of here, yeah. what, which is so Satan and so unlike God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that's what it feels like to me reading Revelation where it's like, <sighs> you know, you're like, sure, it's, yeah. it's kind of, it's pretty intense. And then once they start walking with him, and once they start walking in his way, they're shocked by how these things that are powerless to change begin to change. <laughs> no, I'm going Star Wars. All right. Behind the sermon. What's hey. up, Carl? Hey, Chad. Joe's here too. Hello. Hello. Let's talk first, kind of as a reminder, and I want to hear from both of you guys, when you're preparing to talk to people about Jesus, um, what's the most important thing for you to happen during that time, week or two? Um, what do you hope is happening before you're, before you have to step up there? Mm-hmm. And what do you want to happen in your own life and heart yeah. when it comes to whatever you're talking about? I'll go. I can. I can go, Joe. So exactly. kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I um, I will say it's changed over the years, the many years I've been doing this, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, You're pro. Yeah, yeah. I um, will say that the, the number one thing now is I just, I've recognized my futility, like the futility of my capabilities to, to change hearts, to actually grow mm. the fruit that Jesus wants. And so... Um, whether I start in this place or find myself in this place, it's usually just praying like, Lord, would you till the soil of our hearts? Mm -hmm. Like, would you till the soil of my heart as I begin? But also would you go and ready all of us to hear from your word and try my best to let the word do the work, you Mm -hmm. know? And so, yeah, really it's a lot of prayer and then just trying to, get low and see what God has in that chapter. You know, it's, it, it isn't that complicated. Mm -hmm. The It gets complicated when you start bringing in commentaries and all that kind of stuff. And then you're sifting and praying which one Lord, but it's that place. Like God, I recognize I can't do what you want me to do by myself. Mm -hmm. And so would you lead, would you guide? Tilling of your heart, Mm -hmm. the tilling of the soil. Joe, was that, has it changed for you and your time being a pastor? Have, did you used to do it or have certain like expectation? And then how did that evolve over the years? Yeah, at, at some point in time, I realized that I am not even close to a manuscript person. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of how you're taught in mm-hmm. seminary. Um, and that, so that was hard for me the first few years. Uh, you had to find my gate, you know, my who God made me. Um, and then when, when I moved from the church in Hastings to Winona, then I had to kind of learn things all over again because there's a certain way that at that point Pastor Rick was, you know, teaching. And I thought, okay, well, maybe that's what they want. Um, So it took me a little while then to adjust back to who Mm -hmm. God made me. And so the the, kind of the, the passage that I think about almost every time that I um, am preaching is comes out of Ezra. Ezra had set his heart uh, to know uh, the law and to practice it and then to teach it. So it's on my Mm -hmm. mind to really let the scriptures that I'm studying to teach on have its way in my own Mm -hmm. gut, you know, and mind and heart and feelings and behavior. Um, and since I don't manuscript, I, I'm, um, I never, you know, this sounds crazy maybe, but I never stop thinking about the text until yeah. I'm done yeah. teaching. It just, I'm constantly thinking about, it. I've heard you say, Chad, that you're, you know, you're going over and over in your mind when you're rolling around mm-hmm. the lakes yeah. on your blades. And um, it just, <laughs> so, true. so I think that, um you know, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I want it to really have its way in my own life. Mm-hmm. I think that allows me then to have that authentic, authentic uh, way to, um, you know, present that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and if, I don't know how, I don't know if this is good or if this is bad, but I, 
since I don't use manuscript, the first service is usually different than the second mm -hmm. service. I learn some things or whatever. It, I don't know how spiritual it is or how just, you know, maybe it's my own laziness, whatever. Um, no. But I never know. I never I know what... I love that about you. I love listening to first and second. Yeah. 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 You get... Yeah, it's, it's really cool sometimes how the Lord will highlight something else in your heart right. and bring it right. forth. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. The, the Ezra 710 passage really mm -hmm. shapes me. Um, also, the, I... Um, I think I've communicated this with y'all, but I have a, I have come to grow these last, this last, you know, 10 years of my pastoral ministry to recognize the grace of sermon preparation. Hmm. It's a grace. I mean, there's nothing hmm. like that. On one hand, it's, you know, the nerves and anxiety are there and I don't yeah. like that, but there's nothing compared to meditating on God's word and to really ruminating that that is that a good word is that ruminating right? is that a swear word that. yeah it's a it's a cow word right yeah <laughs> so dairy farmers will understand there you go ruminate um, ruminate yeah um it, it, anyway that that is the um it, it's a grace yeah I, I i feel so much closer to the lord on those weeks that i'm preaching and i wish i could discipline myself on the weeks i'm not preaching to be that intense sure, yeah. um so it's a grace preaching actually has become a grace for me yeah. um the so. reason i ask it is a revelation above any book i've ever read because you can't nail down right things as mm. as people do sure and obviously that's where the conflict comes yeah. but i've found that it is so much the sit in it and ask Lord, mm -hmm. what do you mm -hmm. what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. Like, what is? I was telling um, some of the college students yesterday as I came down to steal coffee, <laughs> Carl. Sorry, <laughs> no, no, that's um, good. But I, I was just saying, like, it's it's absolutely crockpot smoker for mm -hmm. me. It's mm -hmm. it's throw this really tough piece of meat, me meaning my brain, <laughs> onto <laughs> the Lord and His Spirit, and just saying, what do you want to focus on? How do you want to? transform you know you mm -hmm. said like mm -hmm. have its way in your heart mm -hmm. you said to till the soil that's the same thing for us and i think hopefully people know that about us uh, as teachers that we are we never go okay this is week 39 of year 2023 and therefore we should read this right. mm -hmm. not that there's no, there's nothing wrong with what they call those lectionaries or yeah kind of yeah. you know like that's great to have a reading but I just, I think we are, what's God doing this week? And and I really have been forcing myself, I'm actually in prayer right now about this whole process because the tendency in my heart has been to uh, be afraid of somebody somewhere who wants me to preach a certain way. Right. Sure. Yeah. And sometimes they let you know that mm -hmm. you're not doing it the way you should. Or, mm -hmm. And... This, those things are hard to hear, but it's the, that place of you, Joe, you talked about knowing who you were and then coming and hearing someone else and then feeling like, oh, maybe I should do that. Mm -hmm. But then it's almost like the Lord like forces you to get back to who you are mm -hmm. yeah. um, to let the word kind of grab your heart and, yeah. and move. And I, I feel like that's what we are. It's never, oh, I learned all this stuff and I can put it in my notebook mm -hmm. and add to my head knowledge about Jesus, it's, hey, that was Carl. Wow. Mm -hmm. that it, God was doing things in him when he was reading God's Word this week, and I'm not sure if that happens in my life. I'd like mm -hmm. for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, like that's like golden mm -hmm. when we have people going, I think I should spend some time mm -hmm. and ask the Holy Spirit, what would you like to say to me? Yeah. So the last few chapters are if you're going to pick something to let God say something to you, these are kind of intense. Mm -hmm. We have uh, bowls of wrath, not bowls of cereal. <laughs> um, we've got beasts and dragons. Um, and I kind of wanted to do real quick, just, just to ask you guys, but because I think it's, we've been, it could be this. And the most frustrating thing in the world is reading commentaries where they say, may alludes to, <laughs> could be, yeah 
possibly right. is and, this. Yeah. And, and I would and say, wait, do you want to say that. anything? We feel that way, though, when we're studying right. ourselves. But <laughs> so I'm when like, I read, I'm like, okay, you don't know either. <laughs> yeah. But as I'm reading, I want to punch them. <laughs> right, right. I want to say, say something. Yeah, we need something here. Be yeah. brave and actually say. So I, I just this week, it felt like one of those weeks where I was like, all right, Carl, who's the lamb? Jesus. Okay, Joe, who's the dragon? Satan. Carl, who's the woman? The first one that is has the baby in the wilderness, and that dragon comes after her. Mary. Mary and? Creation. <laughs> creation? I think the creation story is in there. Okay. Oh. Yeah. But this is mm-hmm. cool, because this is how the Bible works. Also, um, someone else would say that it represents the faithful people of God through history. Mm. So yes, is Israel, like Mary was in that line, and Jesus came, because, but it's... You know, like there's that part of she gives birth to a male child who is the Messiah. Right. So mm-hmm. obviously, mm-hmm. but then there's a bigger theme of the dragon is is making war against her and her mm-hmm. offspring, right. which means it's everybody. Right. Um, the beast, Daniel's not here, even though he preached on him. But do you remember what would you say the beast? What have you learned, Carl, <laughs> listening to Daniel preach? Oh, over the years? No. So much. The beasts. <laughs> Who are the beasts? The beasts from the sea and the land. Any do you remember? I'm I'm struggling to remember. Where's your Sith? <laughs> my Sith. And your sickle when you're in- <laughs> Oh my scythe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going Star Wars. Where's oh, the geez. where's the dark Sith? No, I'm just kidding. Yes, yeah, It is scythe. <laughs> Sorry, Luke. Man, I was trying to. Yeah, I was yeah. trying to be all You're just up. Just instructing in, us on I was this. Trying earlier. to be all up in what you know about, and I don't know about it. Yeah. All right, you're out on this right. question, Joe. Beasts, beast, land beast, sea beast. Yeah. I don't differentiate very much between the dragon and the beasts. Okay. Um, one They're of the closely things, associated. One one of the things that I can't remember if it was Scott McKnight or if it was uh, uh, Eugene Peterson. When you see beast, think propaganda. When you see dragon, think power. Mm. I like mm. that. Yeah. And so, and, and as you then, as I've read the text on those two um, images, those two um, beings, it, it's helped me. Okay, the beast is just mm-hmm. doing the propaganda up here on the planet, on the earth, out of the sea. Um, two people, the propaganda of Satan. Yeah. Um, but it's completely driven by personified. Satan, mm-hmm. uh, the dragon, to me. Um, the one that differentiates then is the prostitute. Yeah, she <clears throat> represents um, the powers and the and the wealth of the nations, uh, specifically. You know, um, another name for Babylon, Babylon, right? The right, prostitute, right? Yeah. Um, and I didn't really differentiate them until the end of chapter seventeen, when the beast just completely bucks off the prostitute and sends her to be eaten by the birds. Mm-hmm. Like. Oh, okay. That's yep. they don't like each other. That, that was you. That that yep. the beast was just using sexual immorality mm-hmm. as an an idol, you know, temptation. Um, and then at some point in time, the prostitute no, no longer had Babylon. No longer has use to Satan. You're you're out of here. Yep. Wh- which is so Satan and so unlike God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I like your connection with the beast and the dragon, and I think I would. The way I might phrase it is that the dragon, being Satan, empowers the these henchmen. Yes. Um, I think Daniel's phrasing that he had for us for the land of the sea, or the beast of the sea and the beast of the land, was political power mm-hmm. and what we see in the world. Um, and then the other is really interesting, especially in our time right now. It's worship. Mm-hmm. of that power mm. and religious and hoping yeah, yeah and religious and religion hoping that mm-hmm. that is what will save us mm-hmm. so I actually picture the dragon and, it, and it's helpful i think this is what relation does you you have images but i just i just picture like almost like they're like he's a puppeteer and he's they're marionettes and it's just like sure. i'm doing this in the world and i'm doing this in the mm-hmm. world um but that alone just for me if if i took nothing from this whole several month study of revelation just the understanding that Satan's power in the world, and not like weird um, where you're watching something or you're trying to have a conversation over dinner and somebody mentions something about a political party and you're like, that's because they're controlled by Satan. Sure. <laughs> it's like, oh, how long do we have to sit here? <laughs> <Is> people... <laughs> What's for dessert? But nuanced, very 
um, thoughtful conversations about demonic power, right. mm -hmm. what really is happening, because understanding that there's uh, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We're going to get the trash right now, if anybody's listening to that. So having a gentle approach to talking about spiritual power and demonic forces and... You know, like if you could have, imagine having a conversation with somebody who doesn't even have that as a possibility. Right. And you're friends with them and they respect what you think and what you say. And so you don't want to be the kind of individual that's like when you're just talking about life and like, yeah, you know what? I could just really, my neighbor, I'm pretty sure he's possessed by the mm -hmm. devil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to take him cookies anymore. And your friend would be like, uh, uh hello. Mm -hmm. But we can say that if, if the enemies, like if Jesus defeated spiritual powers and forces and that those things, like you can connect them directly to these political powers, religious powers, there's something happening. Mm -hmm. How that is solved, we don't know. Exactly. Um, I think my biggest question, even thinking about, because, you know, you read a revelation and you feel like you're watching a bit of Lord of the Rings type stuff mm -hmm. and you're, mm -hmm. you're Samwise Gamgee outside the window right. and Gandalf pulls you through. You've been dropping E. I've been dropping no Eves. I promise. I just heard something about a dark Lord in the end of the world, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what it feels like to me reading revelation where it's like, Ugh. you know, you're like, sure, it's, yeah. it's kind of. It's pretty intense, but there's also a part where remembering that the beginning of this book is about you loving Jesus and getting excited about who he is. And so you mentioned the prostitute, the harlot, um, Babylon, uh, and the bride. Because if you've got a harlot and a prostitute, so you see a lot of counters in this. Mm, you know, mm -hmm. you have the lamb and the dragon, um, you have the woman, you know, and then the woman who are the people of God, and then you have those who belong to the harlot, and they're a part of that. So um, closely connected to the woman, but is the bride, which is? The church? The yes. The bride of Christ? Also, though, it's, it's described as the new Jerusalem coming down, So, but you're mm -hmm. still on it because we are living stones, and we all have a destiny to be stuck in a wall like this <laughs> as living stones. No. <laughs> Which is why it's so important to really think through symbolic imagery, mm -hmm. you know, and not to move through literal stuff. Hey, um, can we go back to spiritual warfare stuff? For sure. And, and so I had this experience uh, two nights before I preached last on, on the 17th chapter. Mary Beth and I were out to dinner with a, a, a couple that um, don't go to church anywhere, uh, don't believe. Um, and... Mary Beth was talking about inviting them to church. And here I'm preaching two days later on spiritual warfare, mm. on the dragon and on mm. the beast and on the prostitute. I'm like, how do you, how do you even communicate that type right. of thing to a couple like this, yeah. you know, that would come? And on one hand, I was like, I'd love for them to come. But on yeah. the other hand, I'm like, how do you, for lack of a better um, uh, metaphor, how do you gear this down to yeah, sure. communicate? And so uh, there, there are some words in revelation that ground spiritual warfare like accusation mm -hmm. and everybody f has felt guilty oh, yeah. or felt like they're you know they, they have fear because they 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 feel like they're going to be be caught every every human being i think can relate with having someone accuse them of something sure. and what that does the other one in the last couple of chapters has been deceiving yeah and that there is for some reason, human beings, even if you can't, don't have a, a category for the spiritual realm yet, we know about the, 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 the power of deception mm -hmm. and how that is used and leveraged and, and in so many, many different ways. So I think there are ways for people inside or outside the church that don't have um, categories for the words like beast and dragon and Satan and evil in that spiritual realm that we can talk about these real human issues and then the then the follow up question okay where where does that come from yeah you know and and hopefully you come to a place well gosh everybody seems like um, have a tendency to be dishonest or to be accusatory you know mm -hmm. try to blame someone else for stuff maybe they they're yeah. trying to cover up um, that is a way forward then I think in relationships with people. 
but but in in Revelation and I should say and in Revelation we just get it in poetry yeah. and imagery. Um, I I think that we I've, I've come to really appreciate Eugene Peterson's take on the Book of Revelation more than I realized I was when mm-hmm. I first started reading his book. What's it called? Return Thunder. Reverse Thunder. Reverse Thunder. Um, he says this is poetry, mm-hmm. and we have to approach it completely different. And this is a poet who is mixing mat and matching things with no rules, mm-hmm. just like a poet. Yeah. And he's using Old Testament just little phrases and completely um, changing their original meaning back in the book of Isaiah or Daniel 7 to fit where, with the vision that God, that the angels are giving him at a certain point. And it's poetry. So we, that has been really helpful. And I had a sense on the front end of studying Revelation. I didn't want to do it because I did not know how to study it well mm-hmm. to the point of teaching it to other people. Mm-hmm. The way that we were trained, you know, in our in our seminary training, did not prepare us really mm-hmm. to do a good job with Revelation, um, and so that's helped me recognize and almost ground me as I'm reading poetry in things that we do know yeah. already about what what who Jesus yeah. is mm-hmm. and and the enemy enemies that we're against, and so that helps me a little bit I not really like mystify that. it. Because no, it's, it's connected, they can connect to it right away. They right. know what it's like to be deceived or yes. to have somebody lie. And I think most people would, I think this is what I hear you saying, they would, even if they may not have a category for, that's a dark spiritual problem. Right. But they can be like, but it is a problem. And right. I really don't like it. Right. And I, I, and I feel, don't know what to do with it. Yeah. I, feel, this, I feel powerless over it. Mm-hmm. You know, that type of thing. Yeah. I, it, you made me think of, um, and I can't quite find, um, it was, you know, like with poetry and writing, so Thoreau, his whole, do you remember his, uh, I went to the woods? Um, mm-hmm. so he, he kind of has this whole thing that I went to the woods, like to basically like, I wanted to live quiet and purposeful and like, he's kind of this uh, iconic writing mm-hmm. cabin yes. by the, this yeah. lake, but he, it was this deep inner sense of, I have to, I have to get away from all of this. And I got to get to a place where I can focus. And so it's that there are like touch points with people where know that I don't connect with hearing dragon um, or Babylon. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, though, if somebody is in a conversation about current events, political events, fears about political events, fascism, mm-hmm. Nazis, those kinds of things, then they go, whoa, you can't use those words. You can't bring, you can't call this that. And to me that it's like you're, it's just finding different words that connect in our current time. Um, I don't know, like I even think like the, with college students, Carl, have you ever had somebody come up or in a conversation or in a village group or something and they're trying to put words to it, but it's this, it's kind of what Joe's talking about. They just know something's wrong. Yes. Yep. And how do like, how do people usually try to say that <laughs> or even just speak it's, from personal so, yeah, experience. Yeah, no, what no. Is that like? like the thing that I feel like they usually get to is kind of what you're talking about. They're recognizing that there's something going on mm-hmm. and that they're kind of, they're recognizing that they're powerless to change it. Mm-hmm. That is the very common place that they yeah. find themselves. And I think that's when people begin to open up and recognize, okay, I need a power other than myself. Mm-hmm. And they start to open themselves up to this Jesus guy. Mm-hmm. Right. And then once they start walking with him, and once they start walking in his way, they're shocked by how these things that are powerless to change begin to change. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing I think is really interesting about um, these like spiritual things. Mm-hmm. Because I think there, there can be, and not for everybody, obviously, there can be a tendency to, once you get into the whole faith thing, then you want to just talk about those spiritual things sure, sure. like that, you know, like, and then there, are sometimes people hyper spiritualize things. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is when I read the good book, when I read, especially like, you know, a lot of the new Testament, Paul's letters and how to walk out this life, it isn't hyper spiritual, Mm -mm. even though this is our spiritual book. Mm -hmm. Like you read Ephesians and that's where we get, I think our clearest picture. 
And it literally just tells us these few verses, like our battle isn't against flesh and blood, remember? Yeah. It's against these powers, these principalities over mm -hmm. this present evil age, this darkness. And so you're like, whoa, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. But then our what, what, what we're called to do to respond is just to hold on to these blessings, mm -hmm. to wear them as mm -hmm. armor. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to this spiritual realm, when I look at scripture, it's obvious to me there is a spiritual thing going on. But what God says is enough for us yeah. mm -hmm. is holding on to these blessings. We don't need to know everything about it. Otherwise, he would have given it to yeah. us. Yeah. Instead, he's like, all right, you ready? There is this cosmic battle going on. You're going to hold on to salvation. You're going to wear it as a helmet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going to hold on to the righteousness, the imputed righteousness of Christ, and you're going to mm -hmm. wear that as a breastplate. It's going to mm -hmm. protect your heart. Mm -hmm. right? You're going to wear the belt of truth. You're going to mm -hmm. hold on to truth because it holds mm -hmm. everything together. Mm -hmm. And then when these lies, when these accusations, when they come to play, you're going to go to bat with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Yeah. And you're going to hold firm to these truths. You're going to hold up that shield of faith, those lies, those flaming arrows of the enemy. When they come at you, you're going to be like, I trust yeah. that Jesus has me. Mm -hmm. And so when it, I, I tend, especially with college students as they're entering into their faith, making their faith their own, coming to know the Lord for the first time, I steer pretty clear of like this hyper spiritual talk mm -hmm. because I found it oftentimes is soil for selfish ambition for like me wanting it my way for, and, and I don't think it's always intentional, but sometimes just, you know, spiritual abuse mm -hmm. or, you know, like mm -hmm. putting your, oftentimes putting your feelings yeah. at the center and giving it the authority of God, which is a really scary thing. Right, right. And so I tend to, as I continue over and over and over again to pour over the New Testament writings and what we're called to do, it's oftentimes very practical mm -hmm. ways to walk, mm -hmm. walking in the way of Jesus, right. holding firm to these truths, letting mm -hmm. them guide our lives, and loving God with every fiber of my being and doing my best to love those around me. Yeah. And so that... I know that's such a simple call. I know people want those deeper things. But when I look at scripture, it's about relationship with God and mm -hmm, relationship yeah. with others mm -hmm. and bringing that back. That's where I want to put my effort, you know? And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I love it. I love even what you did there with the kind of the putting on the armor of God. You're doing what Revelation wants us to do, which is you were you were taking the metaphors and you were applying them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like you were you were understanding where they go. And I, I think it is simple. There's this because it's like even when you get to Revelation, this idea of which, well, let me do this. You go to the doctor, yep, and you you can't breathe, and your heart's racing, and you're you know you've been nauseous, and so these things are related to some deeper problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you have a physician who's trained and does this. To me, like Revelation is when it points out like here's what's happening in Babylon, here's what's happening with the beast, here's what's happening with the dragon. Um, it is. It's trying to get you to that place to say, oh, I do feel this deeper problem. I, yeah. found, I found my quote from Thoreau. Uh, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, mm. to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die discover that I had not lived. Mm. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear. Nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life kind of goes on but like to me that's a human being mm -hmm. even if they're not saying like oh, i need god <laughs> they're saying what i'm doing something and the system i'm a part of yeah. mm -hmm. so let's just go revelation the babylon i'm a part of mm -hmm. and the forces that are controlling that city and the i don't understand all of them but i don't like it yeah mm -hmm. i don't like it and i want out like mm -hmm. i want to and so i think john is He's telling the story from ancient days that here's the answer. Mm -hmm. it, it is the lamb. It's the way of the lamb. It's surrendering yourself to, you know, his conquering cross and resurrection. Um, yeah, it, it is a, it's an interesting because it, it kind of, it's very simple, but it also begs us to um, not look for in like a revelation, like, okay, what is that? mean and like mm -hmm. i'm gonna nail that down like okay mm -hmm. um I, I feel like this discussion of spiritual battle is is a huge one that that is also very hard to get your 
your hands mm-hmm. around. Mm-hmm. The, the, there's a theme in the last several chapters we've been working on, uh, there, or there's a word that comes up several times. It's the word wilderness, mm-hmm. one time mm-hmm. desert. Um, and we see both the prostitute goes to the desert yep. for one reason, but we see the mother goes to the desert in the wilderness uh, in chapter 12. And um, we, we know that Jesus went to the desert, to the wilderness, you know, in his inauguration, right after he was baptized, to yeah. be tempted and to fast and, and all that as a, an example for all of us. Um, and so this, so the wilderness is a place where both really good clarity can happen, but also where a lot of evil happens hmm. in that vacuum, in that space out there. I think it's interesting that both the prostitute goes to the wilderness. That's where the angel brought John to see the prostitute was in the wilderness. And that's where the angel brought Jesus or brought John to see uh, the, the, the mother of, mm-hmm. of, of mm-hmm. Jesus in the, in the desert. So there's something about, you know, throw might be on that. And we've heard this a lot. Mm-hmm. We, we, you know, we, we study the life of Jesus. Oftentimes he got alone to got a desolate away. place. Yeah. Um, and so I think in the spiritual warfare, there's a, there's both a warning about going, getting alone in the wilderness, but there's also a draw to it for the sake of clarity. Let's lose the noise. Let's, you know, put down for us, it's put, put away our cell phone, maybe, you know, not even take it with us mm-hmm. and get quiet, um, eat really good, healthy food that we, we don't get all fogged in our head, uh, just to be alone and listen and get, get our feet back underneath us. And I think that is a lesson that comes from the book of Revelation mm-hmm. uh, and is, is validated certainly in the life of Jesus and other passages of Scripture. Mm-hmm. But there's something about the wilderness. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is even though the prostitute represented the city, the big, busy, wealthy, powerful city, she was in the, in the wilderness. Um, because the, the, you know, the city is in the book of Revelation is uh, in the poetry is um, contrasted with the kingdom of God mm-hmm. in the city of man. Um, and both parties want to go to the desert. Hmm. And so I, I, I feel that. Do you, you know, when you get all busy, you're like, just mm-hmm. leave me alone for a little yeah. while. Help me get my feet back underneath me. I think that's really an important part of our spiritual growth. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Jesus often, t- I don't know, I don't know where I'm going. I feel like I'm repeating myself now. But, no, I, you know. I like the, I mean, and part of it even goes back to our original question of what are we hoping that happens in our hearts when we study and what are we hoping happens in people um, is this, if you don't meditate on it, if you don't allow the Spirit of God to teach you, mm-hmm. um, then nothing will happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you mm-hmm. really will be, you'll just stay kind of hooked in to the matrix and <laughs> just continue right. to do the things of Babylon and continue to do that. And mm-hmm. so there is a there is an active moving into what would be in our minds, in our flesh, things we might not like, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is to quiet, get quiet. Um, you know, we just we're studying something as a as a senior leadership team, just kind of going through this place of solitude, just trying to how do you get where you're like, Lord, minister to me. Uh, I was even trying it this morning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, we're, hard. We're, we're bad at it. It was uh, so hard. I think most of it yeah. so doesn't come natural. Well, my dog was climbing on me too, and I'm yeah, like, right. go away. I'm right. trying to. Yeah. <laughs> but just to, you know, and you're like asking, like, Jesus, you know, minister to me. Holy Spirit, help me understand and see. And knowing that getting away from all the stuff, you know, your phone and the different things that are there, um, it's just interesting as we kind of get, and we're getting close to the end here of Revelation, um, and I, we would love to actually to hear, and so I know people are listening and there are opportunities to ask questions, but I just want to say too, if you want to uh, just make a statement as well on what God has been doing mm-hmm. in your heart, you can click on the same button and just let us know, like say, hey, here's, here's some of the things, some of you do this anyway with emails, but here's some of the things that God has been doing as I've listened, as I've read myself, um, and I always go back to the, you know, you go to a museum to see a famous painting, 
and I think this is one of the most famous paintings in the world. Mm -hmm. of, you know, that God has painted through the book of Revelation, through the hand of John, the Spirit. And you don't come away with, you know, technical details mm -hmm. about the pigments that were being used mm -hmm. or the history of this artist. You just come away with emotions and feelings mm -hmm. and longings. And Hey, Chad, when, it, you know, you're getting ready to, to take on chapter 19 mm -hmm. and there's a lot in that chapter it's yeah. the battle it's you know and uh, so i know that if you're like me you're kind of still really working on it yeah but what what's kind of at this point anyway kind of rising to the surface yeah. for you something that you think the lord is wrestling right. with you in your life and maybe wants to wrestle use you to help us wrestle with some things on yes. Sunday. yes so this is the famous passage of Jesus on the white horse mm -hmm. um, and infamous in the Left Behind series mm -hmm. because it's when Jesus melts the faces of people. Mm -hmm. And just uh, the thought of it, you're just like, ugh. Which part of me wants to go, did you melt their faces so that then you could resurrect them? Right. Because everybody's resurrected. We know right. that. Right. And you're, some are resurrected to eternal punishment. So it's like, yeah, I had to do that to you because you were really bad mm -hmm. for not accepting me and now you're consigned to eternal punishment, but just wanted to stick it to you first mm -hmm. and melt your face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so new paradigm for understanding apocalyptic literature for me, a new way of looking at it that isn't necessarily linear. Uh, obviously this is a future fulfillment, mm -hmm. but if we actually go back through Revelation, there have been a few times where They've said, this is it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the end. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wait, it isn't. Mm -hmm. And then, this is the final blah, blah, blah. Wait, not quite. Mm -hmm. And so, but we do know this, like of all the passages, like this is the one that's kind of saying, hey, here is where Jesus is going to, it's the final, final defeat to everyone that is against him. I think where I've been the most struck, and we'll talk about this Sunday, but um is that he's, his robe is stained with blood. And I think the first time I heard this, I was like, no way. Um, many scholars believe it's his own blood. Mm -hmm. And because he, he has a sword coming from his mouth, but he never, there's not any fighting from the other people, like or for the, from those who are gathered. It's just, he just has the sword, he's robe dipped in blood. And so speak, think of that too, of a sword from his mouth. Yeah. The word of God. He's speaking. Right. Yep. Yeah. He's just speaking the same way mm -hmm. in creation. Mm -hmm. um, he is pronouncing this is finished, mm -hmm. but it also, you have to like, so how did God do battle on the cross, you mm -hmm. know, and by shedding his own blood for his enemies. And it doesn't mean that there isn't a finality to God giving people what they desire and mm -hmm. what they've asked for in rebellion they're asking not to have him and so i think there will be a it, revelation is making this grand um exaggerated you know really huge words um and descriptions of destruction to communicate symbolically how great this loss will be mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. those who do not Mm -hmm. except what Jesus has done. Mm -hmm. right. I, I hear you saying in that last phrase, uh, you know, that people who do not, uh, that, that sounds present tense, mm -hmm. like even right to the end. Yeah. Um, it would, to me, it's just like the Lord to give people an opportunity to bow their knee, to confess with their yes. mouth yeah. that Jesus actually is Lord. And, and so I, I think once again, the sword that comes out of his mouth uh, it cuts both ways. It cuts in mercy and it cuts in judgment. Yes. And and I, that's a beautiful picture to me, mm -hmm. especially because I think you're going to be in 21. I was really okay. hoping I could teach 21 because of just one verse in there. It's verse 24 and 21. Well, just do it anyway. Yeah, well, anyway. Talk about that verse whenever so, you do it. So the, the, the phrase is uh, kings of the earth mm -hmm. is used uh, in the passage I was working on, on 17, and then it's also used earlier in the book. And it's it's the, the ones that the prostitute has enticed to follow after the beast, right? Mm -hmm. And then in 21, we have this, the new heavens, we have the new, we, we, we have the, the, we have the, um, the festival, the, the, we have the, the feast. And 
who is bringing all of their wealth into the kingdom of God, the kings of the earth. Mm. It's really an interesting mm. passage yeah. to me, which and I have never before when I've thought about the book of Revelation, when people would ask me, is it going to be possible for a person to be saved in the tribulation? Sure. And I would always be, no, you know, it's appointed for men to I once, and then comes judgment, yada, yada, yeah. yada, good passage. Good but, hmm. you know, um, but it, but this repeated phrase in the book of Revelation, and they did not repent, means, doesn't mean that all of them didn't, yeah. but the majority didn't, but there's some that did. Right. And to me, the kings of some of the kings of the earth, just like some of the Pharisees that they thought would never come to know Jesus, came to know Jesus mm -hmm. in against all odds yeah. and against a cultural current that probably cost them their their livelihood. Yeah. Um, and I, so I don't know. I'm, I just. So when I think about 19, and you've helped me with that, you've all along said, I, you know, this. The sword is from his mouth. It's his word, and the blood right. is his blood. That's how he does battle, and it's his blood that brings a remission of sin. If mm -hmm. someone is willing to acknowledge Jesus, yeah. I still. So, so from now on, for the rest of my life and in, yeah. in my ministry, I want to see absolutely God is a God of grace and mercy, and second chances and third chances, right. and that's so. It's really given um, highlighted my understanding and love for this James 2.14 passage that says that mercy triumphs over judgment. Mm, yep. Ooh, yes. Right? And I still think that's happening. Yep. It will happen. I well, think, yeah, if the lining up, if you think about just the, the idea of lining up and like, does anybody want to surrender? Right. Before totally, I totally. do this. Yeah. Because this you is You see it. who I am. Yeah. I, you know what I did. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I, I think... If that would be a phrase that I would say that God's mercy is so much greater than I've ever thought. Yes. Mm. That's what I've learned from Revelation. Didn't anticipate that though no. when I studied the book of Revelation, no. but that's what I'm coming away yeah. from. But mm. I also would say this, and to reject that mercy is so much more severe than I ever thought. Right. right. Yes. That, so it's both, but I, I right. see him, the gentle, kind, like that. That was the first image when I started reading. I listened to Scott McKnight's podcast on his Revelation for the Rest of Us book, mm -hmm. and he started talking about this passage, and I was like, surely that's not in there, that hmm. Jesus is this violent, crazy guy on a horse. And, um, but sure enough, it's there, and that's how it's been interpreted, and mm -hmm. it, it's preached that way. Um, and I, I just think, though, man, you, you are seeing... And, and because we are so... This is a moment in time, but this is a moment in time that is connected to... The cross and the resurrection it's also connected to the lamb slain before the foundation of the world right. yeah. and so our concept of time and what's too late and it's just it, we need to just lay it at the altar not mm -hmm. throw it out we just mm -hmm. need to lay it down mm -hmm. we need to feel the weight of we should respond now and i would say that to anybody respond yeah. if jesus is coming because that's the other thing that came out is you know you have two feasts here one is the marriage supper of the lamb and mm -hmm. it's blessed are those who are invited mm -hmm. um and then you have the feasts, but it's metaphorical and it's symbolic of those who have rejected. Right. And but a lot of it is it's very contextual, common language. Back then, when people went to war, mm -hmm. what did they see at the end of that war? Dead bodies everywhere and birds mm -hmm. eating. Mm -hmm. And so people identified with that image. And so it's not a literal God will literally melt faces and then any flesh that's left. Birds, come on, mm -hmm. do my bidding. Here's right. a great and, meal. Yeah. And like in the end of 17, that's what the beast does, though. Mm. Beast brings the birds in to eat the prostitute. Yeah. Which is just what happened to Jezebel, right? In, in, right. In, you know, yeah. Um, and, and it, it is such an interesting place to... Yeah. It's, it's the beast that does that stuff. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, we want to assign these passages, in, in these passages, that Jesus is the one that's doing that. Jesus yeah. has never been about that. Right. Um, you know, but I love what you're, what, how you, you know, how you're at least thinking and helping me see that Jesus is right up to the end saying, look, here's, here's the battle line. I, I really don't want you to have to suffer the consequences that the beast mm -hmm. and those who follow the beast are going to mm -hmm. uh, suffer. I don't want you to do that. Yeah. Will you come over? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's to me, that is the God of the Bible mm -hmm. from Genesis three 
and his love and his compassion, his pursuit of Adam and Eve in all of the rebellion, who's the one that's after them? And who's the one that's sitting back licking their chops? Satan, the, the snake. Yeah. Right? God's like, no, I love you too much. And I can't see him not doing that mm-hmm. right? all the way through to the end. Yeah. And it's so, so then that, that is a beautiful effect for me in studying the Bible. But also, like and I heard you say this just a minute ago too, Chad, I want to highlight it. It also makes me want to work hard on my salvation, not for my salvation, mm-hmm. but with fear and fear trembling. trembling. Mm-hmm. I really, I want to pursue God. I want to do what, what he gives me the ability to do, which is to have victory over the sin that wants to always crouch at my door and take me over. Yeah. Um, I want to work on that. I, and that's, I think that's supposed to be the impact of a book like Revelation mm-hmm. on, yeah. on us. And, yeah, because you know. if you go back to those first century churches who are reading this, mm-hmm. and, you know, Scott McKnight thinks they probably actually saw it almost acted out. Right. Like a little play in, right. in house churches, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the kids be like, yeah. yeah. You know, but I'm coming back next week. Right. But either way, just this sense of it's really going to be okay. Yeah. As long as you stay with him. That's right. Mm-hmm. Stay yeah. like he, he's still the answer. Those, those deep questions that you have like are still answered by Jesus. His kingdom is the one that will last the other ones. I think that's the thing. It's not, not hard to convince people that the kingdoms of this world are crumbling. Right. People right. seem to experience that easily. Carl, wrap us up. Give us the final mm. Carlism. Carl. A C-A-R-L. <laughs> oh, Carl-ism. come on, come on, come on. Um... I okay, guess you can do K-A-R. Yeah, yeah, get out your sickle if you want to. If you I'll get out my the, scythe. Yeah, you're going to do yeah. the scythe on oh, this yeah. one? Right? Be a Sith Lord with <laughs> no, a scythe. I will not. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a thought that I, I was preparing beforehand, just thinking about as I was reading through Revelation 18 after you'd spoken on it. Um, it just it reminded me again of something Daniel brought up in the very beginning, One of the I think maybe the first podcast I was on. But... There are these little phrases in in 18, like in verse 7, as she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since her heart says, I sit as queen, Mm -hmm. I am no widow, Mm -hmm. and mourning I shall never see. It's just this pride Mm -hmm. that even till the end. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I'm never, like, it's me. And I was just reflecting some of the other stuff I was reading this week. um, was reminding me that no man may boast. What is that, Ephesians 2? Mm -hmm. Um, And I was just struck with that, like, human pride really has, like, no place. And it only brings about bad fruit, Mm -hmm. you know? Like, God really is calling us to humility, and there's such a beauty. And we can all attest to that. Mm Mm-hmm. But then I, lower down on 14, it says, the fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you. And I, that just made me think again. This is the thought that Daniel brought up in the beginning. God really cares about what you care about, mm-hmm. yeah. what you genuinely long for and desire. And I'm just reminded of um, hmm. blessed are those who hunger mm-hmm. and thirst for righteousness. And they will be filled. They will be, yeah, they'll be satisfied. Mm-hmm. And I was just... I was thinking about that as we were beginning. I was like, Lord, I want to want you. Like, I feel like I can, con- I can control what I do mm-hmm. right now mm-hmm. to an extent. But, like, I, you care about my heart level stuff. Can you mm-hmm. really just work this stuff from that, like, 18-inch journey from my head mm-hmm. to my heart? Mm-hmm. Like, Lord, will you do this in us? Give us this hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Because I think we get sometimes, this is just... I guess I think in faith we get a little bit jaded because life is long and we continue to mess up. Yeah. Yeah. And so then it becomes, all right, what can I do to just get through to the end? Like, Mm -hmm. how can I, you know, but really I think God would have a lot of heart formation for us. Mm -hmm. You know, he wants to, to radically transform us on a heart level more. So I, I know that's kind of a tangent, but Mm-mm, just thinking so about good. all of this stuff on a spiritual level, 
that is what I think Jesus really is like prizing here, what you long for. And so hmm. I've just recognized in my heart, just I don't like sometimes what I'm longing for. And I, I want the Lord to change that. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I love that part of revelation. It's revealing. That's the picture that's being painted for me. Jesus really cares about what I care about. Yeah. And I really want to continue to lay that down. I think that's, mm-hmm. that's the, uh, the action he has for us, right? Mm-hmm. Repent, believe, mm-hmm. and keep walking. And hopefully he, yeah. he will continue to change us on a heart level. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. That's so good. First week we said, um, it's in one of the books that we read, but if there's one message in Revelation, it's this, Jesus wins. Yeah, yep. yeah. And so yeah. be with right. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, well, cool. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I want to just say again, um, ask us questions, yeah. but also share your story. Share how, and maybe, I think we know the guys that actually are in tech who could maybe change that to add, ask a question slash share your story. Yeah, yeah. Um, just click that button online or on our app, and we'd love to hear from you to hear. We, we, will, we would share some of those on here. Yeah. Like the way we've That'd shared questions, we would love to share some stories of how God has been changing you and lighting up your heart through the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thanks for joining us for Behind the Sermon. Peace. Peace.